Which brings us back to this wonderful place. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening across the world and into your living room. I'm David Dorian Ross, and it's time for the Virtual Pipe Club uh, with me and uh, these guys, the Zoom Room. Say good morning, Zoom Room. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. morning, everybody. How do you do? Is it, isn't that isn't that good a, a good looking group of guys? I'm just I'm I'm telling you. Um, well, as uh, usual, we are streaming live both to uh, Facebook and to YouTube. And if you're watching over there on Facebook and YouTube, this is a great day to be here because we have a fantastic guest. We've already got uh, Kirk from Florida over there on uh, YouTube watching. Hey, Kirk. <laughs> Uh, if you're watching over there on YouTube, remember, and Facebook, remember that you are just as much a part of the group and the conversation and the club meeting as anybody else. And especially today when our um, when, when we pause to ask some questions of our special guest, you can ask questions too, and I'll pick it up and ask them for you. So uh, that's that's the plan for today. Um, where is Where's our buddy Oliver? Oliver is not here today. We're, we're missing all over. Um, so what we usually do before we introduce our guest is just have a, uh, a few minutes when we, when we do some um, housekeeping, uh, which is a phrase I still don't understand. It's become so popular in YTPC and, and pipe community, pipe clubs to say, let's do some housekeeping, which for me is washing dishes. Yeah, I, but, I never got it either. Yeah, but <laughs> but but in this case, it's going to be uh, what are you smoking and what are you smoking it in, and uh, that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to start with Bud because he's got his hand up, and it looks like and Bud's always <laughs> got something good going on. Hi, Bud. <laughs> what are you smoking, good brother? Good morning. I'm smoking uh, some uh, Prince Albert actually. Thank you uh, very much. I've been getting way. back into it very quite a bit. Exciting. And this is a uh, Matt Treasure pipe that I'm smoking it in that he just uh, gifted me the other day and a uh, very nice little pipe. So I'll uh, pass the pipe to uh, Mike Rizzo. Thanks, bud. Uh, I am smoking my Radice Lavat and in it I am smoking my beloved Solani 633 Virginia Flake with Perique, which is my favorite vapor. Uh, I will pass it to my buddy Steve in Colorado. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm smoking a uh, uh, partially bent radice uh, rind, and I'm smoking already London Flake, which Mike turned me on to. Um, so I'll pass it to Eric Bobex. There's an Ivan Kovacs. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> oh, I apologize. The uh, Steve, the, that's very nice of you. Thank you. The, thank you. Um, and so I've I've got a Danish. Oh, where am I? Video. That's where I am. Um, I've got a Danish made uh, Viking pipe, which I got uh, probably a good twenty years ago now, in Copenhagen. Probably my second pipe I ever owned, second or third, alongside a corn cob. And as far as smoke, I've got, I'm prepping um, a Louisiana flake I picked up today from JJ Fox's, uh, my local brick and mortar, and Winston Churchill's cigar shop of uh, choice. Um, anyway, so we'll see how it goes together. They say it's got a note of chocolate in it, so I'm looking forward to that. Let's pass it on to, I've got a hand up, Randall Arnett. Take it away. What do you do? Good to see everybody. We've been through a horrific heat wave here for the last week, and today it's it's tempered. It's down in the upper 80s, which is warm but tolerable. And today I am using my, my raffle pipe. Just absolutely love this pipe. It's, it's a Shakam king size, and it's got some good size to it, good weight, terrific finish, smokes like a million bucks. And I don't know how I got along without it. And in it is some uh, Prince Albert, my daytime blend that uh, is very, very fine, very good. 
And let's see. I see Dimitri right under me. How about Dimitri? Are you there? I'm here. Hello, everybody. Well, uh, today I'm smoking uh, my uh, summertime blend. That's one I made for our 2019 New York Pipe Club barbecue. And I'm smoking it in this bamboo pipe from uh, Thailand. Everything bamboo, shank, and bowl. And I'll pass it to uh, Lou. Thank you, Dimitri. Greetings, everyone from Queens, NYC. Uh, I'm smoking a, a, a wonderful Reiner Barbie asymmetrical bent. Love this pipe, really great pipe. Uh, and in it, I'm smoking some Hamburger Wehrmaster from 2013. Very tasty, wonderful blend, great combination. One of my favorite blends, awesome. Virginia. Yeah, great stuff. Um, okay, Mike Rizzo. How about Mike Rizzo? You chimed in. Why don't you? I went, I went already, Lewis. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Miguel. All right. Oh, thank Miguel. you, Lou. I appreciate that. Um, I'm smoking, uh, my 1969 Dunhill 142 Dublin. And in it is, uh, the early golden slice. Thank you. And I passed the Great 12 Pipe Club to uh, Alvin. Thank you, Miguel. I am smoking my Briarworks bent pot, and I am <clears throat> ventured out of my safe English blend territory and trying some MacBaron vanilla roll cake. This, okay. is, this is my first bowl of it, and uh, kind of seeing how much I would like it. Delicious. And Based on the recommendations of some of you in this group, I thought I'd give it a shot. I and just want to remind see. all you guys when you're passing the torch or passing the pipe, as it were, don't forget to take a look at who's got their hands up because they're the ones who still are in the wing, so to speak. Uh, and then, Lou, you're done. Yeah, thank you. See, that's the you're way welcome. it goes. <laughs> Oliver's not here to take our hands down. That's the problem. Yes, I, oh, I, I'm seeing all the hands. Let's see. We're on the take here in Queens. Okay, Rama. Rama John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Welcome. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. Everything to everyone. Uh, today, I am smoking my Peterson uh, Don Little Rocky, and in it, I am uh, smoking uh, only golden sliced. Now I pass it on to Peter Mins. Yeah, Peter, unmute it, unmute it. Gotcha. Thank you. I was surprised. That's all. I'm I'm obsessed with Mr. Plumridge just because he looks so much like my urologist. It's making me pucker a bit. Uh, <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> sorry, nothing. I like my urologist, but I just saw him like yesterday, and I'm just still like, oh boy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've got a uh, Dunhill pipe. It's a Cumberland. It's not, I guess you can't see it from all this. I always like these, a smooth, smooth top with the rusticated tortoise shell uh, mouthpiece and all that. And early morning pipe, Dunhill vintage early morning pipe. Always a pleasure for me. Um, I, you know who's going to get called on? It's going to be Glenn. Got to always go to Glenn because he's right next door. So cheers. Thank you for, for everything, everybody. Thank you very much, and uh, good day to everyone. Uh, today, the blend of choice is uh, Seven Reserve from Rattrays, uh, an old tin. I think it's probably 15 years old. I tend to smoke the old, old, unobtainable tobacco, but... Uh, and today I happen to be using a cob. I found this when I was cleaning some of my other pipes and uh, decided to give it a try and it's working great. So uh, let's see, hands up. Uh, how about Russell? Hello everybody. Um, in my Stanwell uh, Lumberman here, I'm smoking some uh, McBaron's HH Pure Virginia. It's really nice. Thank you, everybody. Thanks uh, for this club. And how about um, Eric? 
Chief John. Good afternoon. I'm uh, smoking some uh, Gawith, Gawith Hoggart Balkan mixture and uh, can't really see uh, a Bari special hand cut. Yeah, sorry for my camera quality. And um, about uh, Russell. So I just, I just went. Or I didn't plan down. Oh, okay. Uh, Steve. Hey, Spend. greetings, everybody. Great to see everyone. Um, hot, humid day here in central Illinois, and looks like we're in for more of the same tomorrow, but we'll survive. It is summer after all. Today, uh, I've spoken my Savinelli Punta Oro Gold that I've not had for too long. Fantastic pipe. I'm uh, going to load up some of the eight state burley in it. Let's see. Find somebody who hasn't. We've got a hand up. Stuart, Australia? Yeah, good day. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, today, smoking uh, my very first Mearsham, a star Mearsham that uh, I got a, a bent uh, bulldog. And uh, in it, I've got uh, squadron leader. So, looking forward to enjoying that. And uh, let's see who I'll pass it to. Some hands. Tim. Oh, thank you, Stuart. Okay, today I am smoking. Uh, this is a Peterson 312 Pre Republic, which I purchased from our guest speaker today, Marty. Very nice pipe. It's got a really wonderful blast on this side. You can see some of those ripples there in this green grain. Really nice. And in it, I'm smoking. Rat Rays, Howl of the Wind, very great tobacco. And with that, I'm going to pass the virtual pipe over to our guest, Marty Pulvers. You're all on mute. <clears throat> well, thank you. I, I don't want to uh, intervene in, in your uh, Saturday morning ritual. Uh, today, though, I am smoking uh, Eura, one of the pipes that David Field and I imported and distribute, distributed exclusively in the U.S. And I must have snagged this when we were at his home in Bremen. We would go to uh, Europe to pick up the pipes we wanted to import. That was the fun of being in the business, of course. And in it, I'm smoking some old dry, but I like it really dry, Dunhill A11010, sort of one of their iconic Latakia blends. And uh, do I see any hands up? Let's see now. Well, where's Nathan? Nathan, I saw one of my... A uh, good long time correspondence and customers, Nathan Mattia. Why don't you take it away, Nathan? Hey, Marty, you know how to pick them. Hey, uh, I'm not smoking this yet, but I got this from Marty. I'm inside the house. My wife might kill me. Uh, so later today, we'll be smoking some anniversary cake uh, from uh, Hearth and Home, which is a vapor, kind of an all day smoke uh, in this uh, fern down two star little eighth vent uh, panel that uh, Marty sold me not too long ago. It's an amazing smoker. And let's go to, let's, I don't see anybody that is, uh, Dennis, have you gone yet? Thank you. No, I have not. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Got some Viprati here in a pipe that I, I picked up locally from a guy in Eastern Indiana. Is he, his name on it is McLowry, but I know that's not his name because I met him in a police station off the back of his truck. But this thing he claims is Algerian briar. All I can tell you is that it's got gorgeous grain and he's got a nice long, about two inch hole in the middle, uh, three quarters of an inch. And this thing takes Virginia's perfectly. That's why I put some Viprati in it. All right, who else is next? Looking for hands up here. Either I'm not doing this right or I'm missing something. Anybody else got a hand up or wave then? Yeah. So if you look. Yeah, you Isaac know, Jaffe does. Oh, and there I, it is. I, I for, have Isaac, take over, sir. Yeah, for Thank most you. of you guys, when you um, have your gallery on, 
If you look up at the upper left-hand line, you'll be able to see everybody with their hands up. Well, good morning, everyone. At least good morning where I'm at. Um, I'm not smoking currently because I've just been doing chores all morning because it's about a million degrees here in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. But I do have a new pipe to share. Um, it is... Um, a Martello um, from Gustavo in Brazil has a little bit of Fordite um, as an accent piece. Um, it smokes fantastic, and I will be smoking this later today. Love that art on the back, on the wall there. It's awesome. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Anyone else? And then Isaac, you get to pick the next. Lucky sharer. <laughs> okay. Uh, Fadi Hawa, um, I see your hand up. Oh, you're on mute. You're up. Yep. You're muted, Fadi. Fadi. Okay, sorry. Hello, guys. Greetings from Beirut, Lebanon. Thank you, Isaac for passing the pipe to me. Uh, I'm always glad to participate in these meetings. I'm uh, in my corner now, and I'm smoking a bowl of uh, Sir Walter Riley in my uh, Vowen, straight billiard Vowen. It's called, uh, I think it's called uh, Vowen, uh, the collection is, uh, I, I don't see night. I think it's night. So this is it. Uh, and some uh, I'm a Burnley fan, so Sir, Ter Sir Walter Rainey, which is aromatic, but it suits me uh, very well because it's Burnley based. I don't know if you uh, like this tobacco. I love it personally. It's one of my favorite aromatics. So that's it, uh, guys. I hope you are going fine, all of you. And I will pass the pipe to who's, uh, who's next. Help me up. Help me out, guys. Has Chris gone yet? He's gone yet. Chris, Chris Plumage? Chris Plumbridge? Sorry, I couldn't read that. Yep. I'll jump in. And uh, no, I'm not a urologist. I work for a bank. Uh, oh. Sorry there. Um, so, uh, yep, today going to be smoking uh, some Parsons blend. And also, a raffle pipe. This is the uh, Rebia one of the raffle. Uh, let's pass it to um, Amir. Everybody, good morning. Just woke up and I had a shower. So, my buzz might be a little bit cracky. So um, I'm smoking my uh, uh, Russian roulette blend, the mix and match, and my uh, Peter Kotler horn from Russia. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I'll pass by virtual pipe to uh, who's, who's next? Steve? The band? Steve Spent? Right, Chris. I already went. Thanks, Amir. Oh, help me out. Anybody? Chris is waving his hand. Chris Plumbridge wants to tell us about this. Chris just Chris just went. Oops, Chris just went. Um, so the, yes, we this is our this is our regular ritual, but um, we don't force anybody to share. Maybe maybe we're. Um, Maybe we're good for right now if you but you know like we got another couple of hours together guys and if in at any point in time you're like hey um i'm smoking something pretty terrific or my pipe is pretty unique and i want to share that you don't have to just do it at the beginning of the meeting we can do this at any time <laughs> stephanie's here stephanie what are you smoking oh i am smoking a newfound love uh i found bacon old-fashioned I've never tried it, and a really awesome person in the YTPC sent it to me. I was stoked. I tried it, and I am actually really impressed. 
And I have you are the only music. person in the world that must like that blend. Well, I really Tennessee <laughs> because I like it. And I'm I'm drinking some hibiscus Lacroix with um, ice and a splash of whiskey, and it actually made the drink taste like an old fashioned. Give me your address. I'll send you a jar that I have that I have no desire. Excellent. I'll I'll put my email in the chat. So who's next? I'll I'll ship it on to whoever is next. I was thinking that we might have um, run the course of people who are sharing at the moment. Um, but I have something to share, and I also want to um, share some of the people's uh, uh, text, chats, whatever, from our Facebook and YouTube groups, because they're also smoking a bunch of good stuff. Um, Pipe Monkey Gary, I just I, that's a handle I love, Pipe Monkey Gary, says he's um, smoking some Aaron Moore mixture in his Falcon. Uh, <laughs> Boris the Piper, who's... Um, who's not here today, I want to find out if it's above freezing where he is, uh, is smoking some Amphora Burley in our club pipe, which is an awesome choice any day of the week. Uh, who else is here? Maybe that's it for right now. I uh, just finished one bowl uh, in this um, uh Chinese uh, um, HS Studio um, uh, Calabash. And I was smoking in this some straight, un, unprocessed uh, St. James Perique. So I happened to pick up some, some blending tobacco, some full leaf tobacco uh, for something that we might use it for in the club, but I'm not going to tell you any more than that because, you know, anticipate. Patience. Um, smoking Perique straight? Smoking Perique straight. Uh, I've done it on many occasions. Nearby. Yes, I did. I've done it myself <laughs> on many occasions, and I really enjoyed it. You're I, a tough guy. I, 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 I mean, you're I still upright, so that's different a kinds of Perique. Yeah, I uh, smoked at least four different kinds of straight Perique and enjoyed them all, some more than others. I really, that, I really like it. Gord was light tan when he started smoking. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and I was less tan when I started smoking. Yeah, my yeah, yeah my my hair wasn't quite as white when I started smoking. <laughs> um, but then I've switched over, and uh, here I have a brand new pipe. This is from Janos Kokinos. Some of you may have know know him. He he is a member of many of the pipe groups on Facebook and and uh, from Greece. And I saw this pipe on his website, and I'm like, this is so cool. Uh, and I have no idea what I'm smoking in it. It's, it's something I got from Paul's Pipe Shop, and I, I don't really know what it is. So it'll, I'll be discovering it. <laughs> and that's, that's what I've got for us today. Um, so at this moment, what I'd like – oh, Stephanie's waving her hand. You have – yeah, you guys, I was uh, I did my live chat for the last hour, so my laptop is really overheating. It's about 110 degrees outside here, <laughs> and my laptop, I can't even hardly touch it, so I do have to go, but I will continue in the chat. I love each and every one of you. This is an amazing club, amazing people. Remember to just have fun. I love Shoot all of you guys. Shoot me your email real quick, Steph. Shoot me your email over real quick before it dies. Who asked for that? It's I'm Mike Rizzo. Big old fashion. Mike Rizzo. Excellent. Well. All right, Mike. Thank you guys so much. I'll continue to watch. I just have to shut off my laptop. Thanks for being here, Steph. Thank you, Steph. Uh, Always good Thank to see you. Um, and yes, you know what? Uh, Steph sort of uh, reminds me of something I was going to say, and that is I see a whole bunch of people, maybe for the first time in the club here, and I know that many of them were invited or turned on to this by our special guest speaker, Marty Pulvers. And so I just want to say welcome to all of you guys. Um, thank you. And thank you, Marty, for uh, giving us a shout out about the, the, the meeting today. And we hope that you have a good time and come back. Um, and it's only, you know, dues are very cheap, just $1 million to join. No, that's make your checks out to me. Um, <laughs> me and Lou, <laughs> Lou, Lou, we, we have a little racket going. Um, if I get a chance to insult Marty, I'll pay it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> well, so many people do it for free. <laughs> speaking of, speaking of Marty, 
Um, I want to introduce our special guest here who I've only, you know, corresponded with a couple of times and had a brief encounter with when he dropped into the club last week. But in doing some reading up on him, um, I have come to uh, really, really be excited about his being here today. So as I put up on the notice about the, the meeting today, if you've ever been to the West Coast Pipe Show in Las Vegas or have as I have only dreamed of going, then you have our uh, special guest to thank today. Marty Pulvers is the founder of the West Coast Pipe Show, uh, along with many, many other um, accolades and r resume items and whatnot. And we're going to try to get him to tell us a bit about that. So um, I'm going to kick it off with a basic, basic question uh, about how it all began and turn it over to Marty to, to start uh, telling us that story. Marty, well, welcome. Thank you, DDR. And if I start talking too fast because I'm excited, jump in, slow me down. Uh, I'll give you a little background. Uh, I was told by uh, Tim, let me shut the door. I hear gardeners out there and that's going to intrude. Uh, Tim and, and uh, who invited me initially and then DDR said that your guests usually talk about 10 or 15 minutes. Well, I'm not getting up Saturday morning to talk for a lousy 10 minutes. So you guys better have another pipe or another batch of tobacco ready. So I was also even more excited when Tim said that the normal honorarium for a speaker for this club was between... Forty-five and sixty-five hundred dollars, <laughs> um, depending on the prestige of the speaker. But he said, "Son of a gun, our coffers are empty. Would you do it for double espresso, or a cappuccino, but with only one shot?" So I called up my agent at the speakers bureau and told him what you guys offered, and he said, "Take it." So here I am, and thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Let me give you a bit of a background. Marty, while you're, I started while you're smoking a pipe at the age of 18, shortly after that birthday in 1961. So now that's, what, about 60 years ago, which is more than some of you have been alive. And then I started selling pipes late in 1977, pretty much out of necessity, but that will be another story for another time, perhaps. Uh, if you want to see what I looked like when I first put a pipe in my mouth, you can go to my homepage on the website and scroll down. And uh, I was about seven years old at the time with a cap on my head and a corn cob in my mouth. And my folks would put that pipe in my mouth and the cap on my head and throw me in the back of their 1938 La Salle when they took their weekly annual vacation and that kept me quiet. So when my mother came out many, many, many years later to visit her granddaughter, much more than me, I'm sure, she told my wife, Joy, as we were putting my daughter in the back seat, well, when Martin was a little boy, we would put a cap on his head and a pipe in his mouth and he Peter, would stay quiet for most of the light. trip. And my wife said, well, nothing's really has changed except now he's in the front seat. Mm -hmm. So that might tell you a little bit of something about me. And uh, also that all of us are boys at heart. We're just, uh, we've grown a little taller, perhaps a little wiser over the years. Let's see if I can adjust this so that the angle is better there. That's a little better. And uh, that's what we are. We're just, we're just boys having fun with our, with our toys. And I am never tired of uh, handling and fondling pipes, even pipes I've looked at many, many times in drawers that uh, maybe contain the pipes I'm selling. So I'm just easily amused. One thing you're getting from me, though, this afternoon or morning or what evening, depending on where you are, is uh, a, a wider perspective perhaps than from other people. I've been in just about every aspect of the hobby. I've had a brick and mortar retail store, now have the website. I've 
produced shows in San Francisco a number of times. Now I'm sort of co-producer of the Vegas show, although I don't want to work that hard anymore. Uh, I've certainly been a hobbyist. Uh, did I mention the wholesale importing and distributing pipes in the U.S.? The only thing I haven't really done is make pipes. Maybe that's the most important thing, but I haven't done that except once under the very careful direction of Paul Perry, uh, just a marvelous man and a uh, pipe maker since 1927. And there's another story. He actually made his first pipe the day Lindbergh landed in Paris on his transatlantic flight. He remembered that, he told me, because he stole a block of briar from his father's pipe making studio in back of the store. He was born in back of a pipe shop in the Bronx. And he could he had to hide it from his father. He wanted to smoke the pipe he made. So he took it up to the roof and told his father he was gonna just listen to the wireless they had. And as he put it on, he heard Lindbergh landed. What a great mnemonic device, right? He knows the exact date he made his first pipe. Well, because of all of that wide experience, I have stories that could go on for so long, I would never get home in time for supper. So I'm gonna focus on those stories. And what you might gather is, I'm a bit of a generalist. I don't have great specific in-depth knowledge. Each of you who maybe collect a brand or have a focus, you'll know much more about that than I could ever know. Uh, so in, in that sense, maybe I'm a fraud. And that's another reason I never entered long smoking contests as you learned last week. But you had to, who won last week, by the way, Louis? Lester. Let, uh, Lester less, again. Yeah, Les Young. Yeah, yeah, I know Les. I know Les. Okay. But being a generalist isn't so bad necessarily because you might know things that a specialist doesn't know. Let me give you an example. In talking with Ingo Garba at one point, whom I consider the greatest, purest pipe maker alive, we talked about the most important part of the pipe, which I always believe because of the comfort is that last quarter inch of the stem. And he agreed with that. So now let's, by comparison, take somebody who's not so much as a generalist, but a specialist. Let's just pick Savinelli for reasons you'll hear about in a little bit. Let's say you're the, one of the stem makers for Savinelli pipes. And you do that 40 hours a week, 48 weeks a year for X number of years. You really know how to make a stem. And you know about the ebonite or the vulcanite or the acrylic. But what they know is only Savinelli stems. I've been reconditioning pipes since 1977. I've had many hundreds of different brands and stems go through my hands and maybe even a thousand or more. Of course, I never counted. And the experience, reconditioning those pipes has given me a pretty wide range of experience with them. And one thing I know is Savinelli stems tend to get loose where no other stem does. They're a real pain in the ass to work with sometimes. Uh, the condition of a pipe is critical to my being able to sell it, which is my goal. And Savinelli stems can sometimes interfere with that. I can't sell a pipe in which the stem is too loose and I'm not even able in many, many times to tighten up that tenon. Usually I can with a heat gun, but not always. Well, if you ask a Savinelli stem maker, they would tell you, oh, Savinelli stems are the best. We buy the best materials. We make the best stems. I'm here to tell them they're not, and they can't know because they haven't seen that wide variety of stems that I have. So anyhow, that's one advantage that a, that a generalist may have. So a specialist isn't always the person to consult. Dunhill stems, on the other hand, are excellent. They almost always shine up beautifully. They clean up, they're wonderful. So anyhow, I hope that gives you a little sense of perhaps being a generalist as opposed to a specialist might add a little bit to your, or at least my sense of knowledge. Um, 
and it and it comes as no breaking of a confidence that uh, you guys seem to like stories. That's what Tim told me. That's what DDR told me. And uh, let's let's get into some of the pipe stories. Our lives are made up of stories. I think our memories are basically stories we've conjured up for ourselves. So uh, let's see what we can weave from that fabric. And I'll know the attempt today was successful if that tip jar in front of you is filled at the end of the session. <laughs> All right, let's start with a couple of stories centering on people you've already met here. Uh, I'll start off with the Tom Eltang story, that very estimable pipe maker from Copenhagen. I first became familiar with his pipes when I visited Peter Heinrich's house of 10,000 pipes in Cologne, Germany. Peter was introduced to me by a friend who was doing postgraduate work here at Stanford University, bought some tobacco from a little counter I had in a cooperative antique store, excuse me. And uh, Peter came over to visit two of our pipe shows that I produced, so I felt I had to pay the respect and back and go to Cologne, Germany. And I had no money, but I put it together, put the trip together. And uh, Peter showed me a lot of pipes, and one of those was Tom Eltang's. So later, when I went to the Dortmund Pipe Show and met Bjarne Nielsen, a friend of mine even at the time, and drove back to Copenhagen with him, I asked him if he knew of Eltang. And he said, yeah. So he took me over to Eltang's workshop outside of Copenhagen, and as we were pulling up to this workshop, Tom was closing the door and leaving. So we caught him just in time. And I said, Tom Eltang, and I introduced myself. I said, I'd really like to get some of your pipes and bring them back to my store in San Francisco. And he basically said he wasn't making pipes anymore. I think this was probably the late 80s and business was really down for pipes and high grades for sure. Or were really at a nader, I would expect. And he was making kitchen cabinets to keep, you know, house and house and home together. So he did have two pipes, one of which I liked and one of which I didn't like. But talk is cheap. And I said, I'll take both of them because I wanted him on my side. So I came out with cash, bought the two pipes and made arrangements for him to make some more. And the next time I went back to Copenhagen, I can't remember what the interval was between my trips, he had three dozen pipes available for me, all of which I bought and took back to the store. And that happened the second time. So we had what, three dozen and three dozen, six dozen pipes, a couple of which I snagged for myself and still have in my cabinet. <laughs> so that's how I got to know Tom Eltang and be very familiar with him and his pipes. That's almost all the story, but there's a little addendum, which I think is quite nice. A couple of years ago at the Chicago show, I just got it in my head to do a little of a casual survey of what the Danish pipe makers thought, because the Danes don't buy expensive pipes. <clears throat> So I went around just asking the Danish pipe makers at the show if they felt disappointed that their pipes weren't recognized as wonderful products in their own home country. And to a man, they all said, no, they weren't worried about that. But Tani Nielsen asked me a question. He said, do you know who the best pipe maker in Denmark is? And I said, no, I really don't have an idea. I, there's so many wonderful pipe makers coming out of this country. And I thought, well, maybe he meant his friend, his very, very close friend, Teddy Knudsen, who's a phenomenal pipe maker. Or Tani, having a nice ego, might have meant himself. And that wouldn't have been a bad choice, because when he wants to, he can make a pipe as good as anybody. He said, no, the best pipe maker is Tom Eltang. I thought, that's wonderful. That was a really nice thing to say. And he obviously meant it. It was an unsolicited opinion. 
And I'm not exactly sure why, because I'm not a big advocate of saying this is the best or that's the best. There's just so many variables. You can never really say this is the greatest of all time because you have to take things in context. But perhaps it's because Tom has such a wide variety of skills and can do almost anything with Briar. In fact, one time we were visiting, I was with my wife and a bunch of us were just bullshitting in the front of his little shop. And he said to Joy, have you ever seen a pipe being made? And Joy said, no. So he took her in the back. It was so quick. So I'm sure he was making a pipe because when he came out a very short time later, he had a beautiful little bulldog stem and all. And that's how their mind and muscle work so fast. I walked in one time on uh, Phil Vegan, a, a, a Danish pipe maker that Bjorn took me to see, and he was doing a panel. And you know how quick you have to be so that all the sides come out equal. And he, as we walked in, he was with a disc sander and a block of briar, and he was just turning, let's see if you can see my hands, just like this, boom, 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 and all the sides, and it was amazing to watch that mind muscle memory function that way. But so that's one little story that I love, the Tom Meltang story. Let's move on to another guy you've met, and this is a little different kind of story. It's uh, the Bang Boys, and I understand that Pear Hansen spoke to you. Well, one of the times back in, uh, oh, I'll just go back for a second, and Tom, Tom has given me credit for bringing him back into the pipe making market with those trips and those pipes purchased to getting, as I say, getting him making to making pipes again. And there's no question that he would have gotten into it as that part of the market heated up. But it was very nice of him to consider me in that light. Well, as I was saying, at another, at another trip to the Dortmund Pipe Show, at which I was pretty much the only U.S. retailer. And there's a long story there. I'm not going to, the story isn't more than I'm going to unfold here. But it's that U.S. retailers tend not to get off their asses. And all they do is wait for the salesman to come in and bring them the standard factory-made pipes. And every store does need Petersons. And every store does need Savinelli's but also change it up for your customers. Go to these pipe shows, the standard <laughs> some of the craft made pipes by individuals. Many of these pipe makers would be happy to sell it wholesale to stores and the stores would have new product to show their customers instead of the same old standard numbered shapes. There's no reason to go back to the store 20 times if you've seen everything there. But pipe store owners tend mm. not to do that. I don't understand why they're so sedentary. Anyhow, going to the Dortmund show availed me of the opportunity to buy wonderful pipes at very favorable prices. Ashton's, Teo's, Barbie's, pretty much anything that you could get in Europe, you could find at this Dortmund show. Well, at one show, Two pretty big guys next to me, because I'm about five, six, came up to me, really angry expressions on their face, accosted me and said, hey, you Marty Pulvers? They probably didn't have a Brooklyn accent being from Denmark. And I said, yes, we want to talk to you. Oh, all right. And I think I recognized them as being the two pipe makers for S-Bang, uh, Pear Hansen and Ulf Noltensmeyer. So we found a little coffee place on the exhibition floor and sat down and they said, we don't like you and we want you to stop selling our pipes. I go, whoa, what did I do to you? Well, we're now selling our pipes at prices we think we deserve to uptown and you're undercutting us. Oh, hold on a second, I said. I don't discount anything. I'm buying the pipes at fair prices and getting my normal profit margin. I'm not undercutting you. Well, your prices are a lot lower than what Uptown's getting and lower than what we're getting from them. I said, well, that's, that's not my fault. 
you're selling to Uptown. Uptown isn't a wholesaler. They're a retailer. My job is to get the best pipes at the best prices for my customers. That's what I'm doing. Well, they're not the best pipes. The best pipes we make are going to Uptown, so you're not selling the best. I was with a friend who has who owns the Piedmont Tobacconist, unfortunately doesn't still because he passed away. But luckily, he had a bang in his pocket. And Steve, that's his name, Steve Richmond, has a very good eye for pipes. So he pulled out a bang that he had that he bought in Europe at the normal low prices. And he said, here's a bang we got at the low prices. Are you telling me you make a better pipe than that? It was magnificent. Well, that shut those two guys up real quickly. And after that, the conversation started getting a little friendlier. And really what they wanted was for me not to advertise the price, the prices and the pipes that I had. And that wasn't hard because as I explained to them, I just had this one little store in San Francisco. I didn't have a catalog. I didn't have a mailing list from the store. I didn't have website at the time. So we agreed that I would keep going the way I'm going for at least another year, not advertising. And that conversation pretty much ended. And I would say amicably because not short, shortly thereafter, one of the two, and it was probably Ulf, he's a little bit more outgoing than Pear, told me that I should bring in Eltang as an exclusive, which I could have done had I been smart enough to do that, but so be it. So anyhow, that's the that's the story on the bangs. And uh, are you guys bored? Is this uh, no, no, great. nobody's this bored. Awesome. This, no, is, this, okay. is awesome. this is this is awesome. Keep, keep <laughs> but <laughs> you're, you're crushing yes. it. Keep going. Yes. But uh, looking for as long yeah. as you want. But Mar Marty, let me pause. You, let me pause you for just a moment. Um, yeah. Not not because we're bored at all. But I want to. As I do this uh, periodically through every meeting, and that is break for a moment to give the guys who are here in the in the meeting an, an opportunity to maybe ask you some questions. You. Like, I love your stories. They're going to, I'm sure that some of you have, have got some questions or thoughts or comments that you want to share with Marty. And so I'm going to just go ahead and open it up to all of you. Go ahead and just ask Marty them directly. And that goes for the people over there on Facebook and YouTube as well. If you have a question for Marty, put it in your chat there and I will ask it for you. Well, then let me ask a question, uh, Marty. Uh, you have mentioned a lot of high grade pipe maker. Do you uh, mostly uh, uh, trade with high grades or is uh, there are, uh, estates or what is your main focus in pipe selling? Well, interestingly, uh, no. Uh, I love the high grade pipes because they're so beautiful. You're again, they're so well made. Uh, the people who make them are joys to be around for the most part. But I actually started buying pipes at uh, garage sales and flea markets for 25 cents, 50 cents, selling them for $5, $10. That's how I actually made my initial reputation. Uh, on one of the magazines way back when they had an article, Marty Pulver's our kind of guy, what they meant was they could get good pipes very inexpensively from me. I think Lou goes back far enough to know what I sell. And if you ever went to my website, you'll even see I put together four very nice pipes for $35 or $45. They arrive thoroughly reconditioned and cleaned. Uh, I don't t tend to deal with drugstore pipes because they're just too hard to work with and there's no return on them. What are you going to get for a yellow bowl, a buck 50 and put in a half hour cleaning it up? No, but no, no, no. I don't only work with high grade pipes. That's a good question, Jurgen, because if you listen to me talk, you might get that impression. I think you guys, you know, I think you guys should, you know, check out his, his website. I mean, he's got a whole range of pipes. I mean, he's yeah. got some very, very good prices on his pipes. Yes, there's definitely some high grades in there, but 
uh, I think the prices are great. I've, I purchased a number from Marty, you know, which turned out to be really excellent pipe. So you guys should check out his website. Yeah. yeah. Very funny. I was looking at his website this morning and I was going through some of the pipes and, and they are fantastic prices. It's like $45, $65, $90, $75. And then there's one for like $1,200. <laughs> so he's got both ends of the spectrum there. That's the one you should get. DDR, that $1,200 one. Well, um, you know, not just for me, but for all of you guys, next Sunday is Father's Day. Just saying, now's the time to ask. <laughs> and, and don't tell them I told you to do that. <laughs> Martin, this is Alvin from Austin, Texas. Uh, I do have a quick question just based on something, a comment you made. I'm the lucky one that has one of those Sabinelli's that has a loose stem. <laughs> I'm and, sorry. Uh, and, but what I, I guess what you sound like what you suggested is probably the easiest way to attempt to fix that is just a heat gun. Yes. In the stem. Yes. Try that, Alvin. All right. Generally works. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, and that's what right. that that frustrates you. Yeah. Thank you. Yo, oh, you're welcome. Marty, real quick before um, the next person. Uh, Marty, I have a question about your personal preferences in uh, tobaccos. What do you usually like to smoke? I was afraid you would ask that, Dimitri. You know, I'll, I'm a lot of Kia hound. And, but yet I'm picky even in lot of Kia blends. But it's really not about what I like. It's about what you like. The best about who was it earlier, Fadi, no, that said he likes the Sir Walter Raleigh. That pleases him, and yes. so for him, that's the best tobacco. That was me. Oh, was that you, Dimitri? Yeah. No, and, it's, it's uh, Fadi. Oh, it was Fadi. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Thank you. Uh, and that, so what I like is the material. But I do. But I am a Latakia. I just have never cottoned too much to fine Virginias, although once in a while I'll smoke one. And I'll tell you, we were stuck somewhere up in uh, in the Northwest, in fact, <laughs> not far from Miguel, probably. Anyhow, we were in a, David Field and I were in, a, in an inn somewhere, and we were downstairs, and the tobacco was upstairs, but I had my pipe, and he had uh, Prince Albert down there. And, and I lit up my bowl, and it was... It was fine, you know. It was, it wasn't anything I'd go out of my way for, but it sufficed at the time. So it's what you like. It's not what I like. But I, but to answer your question in a straightforward way, I, I do like Latakia, good Latakia, good for me Latakia blends. Yeah, Marty, well, real I, quick. Uh, could, could... I never say that any tobacco is not good. It's a matter of personal preference, and the best tobacco is one that you enjoy the most. That's it. But, you said it. But I'm always curious uh, to find out what other people like mm -hmm. about their personal preferences. <laughs> In fact, I almost gave up pipe smoking because the first pipe I bought, a guy threw a pipe at me. I was 18, as I said. I didn't even know enough to ask a question because I wouldn't have known any of the lingo. And he threw a pipe at me, which is a shape I now don't use like at all. And he threw an aromatic at me, which I really um, averse to and I tried it three times and I almost gave up I went into the store near the college I was going to and I saw all these beautiful tins with beautiful graphics and I saw one tin that was really ugly it had like a khaki color and on black and it said Gallagher's Latakia I didn't even know what Latakia was how could I know but I figured if the tin is that ugly <laughs> they must think that they have some good stuff inside. So that's what I bought. And I just have a predilection, a natural predilection for Latakia. And that worked because I was about to give up pipe smoke. I was about to give up all smoking. I never smoked cigarettes. So it was just dumb luck that I'm here today, so to speak. Because if that had been, oh, I don't know, think of, think of some other aromatic blend or maybe something like uh, straight Perique, God forbid, <laughs> I, I, I would have quit. I would have not continued. <laughs> well, also, when you're 18, you think you know everything. And if not, you want other people think that you know everything. That's why you don't ask questions. 
You mean I didn't know everything? <laughs> yeah, Marty, you're right. Marty, I was just thinking, I, I, have, a, I have a 17-year-old daughter, and... Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm rediscovering that that's true at that age. You, you, of course, you know, everything and everybody else over the age of 18 is wrong. Right. Well, you know, Twain's uh, quote on that basically about how, how smart he, how, how dumb his father was when he Twain was 18 and how much smarter his father got as, as he Twain got older. <laughs> of course, you know, you realize, no, my father told me, Marty, you really should learn from my experiences and mistakes because you won't live long enough to make them all yourself. <laughs> I, have a, I think with age, I'm not getting smart. I'm just realizing how dumb I am. Oh, bo- <laughs> I'll tell you, boy, that is so true. That Ma- is so Marty, true. I have a question for you that may, may kick off your next um, uh, set of, of stories. So, at some point after you started to, you know, resell some of these uh, uh, garage sale pipes and whatnot, it became full time, right? And no, uh, no, it no, never later. Well, it, later. at some point. Well, that's my question. Yes. Like, when was that? Uh, it was when I was working part time at a tinderbox here in Palo Alto. And one of the sales reps for Lane Limited, many of you may know Lane. They they made the One Q and so many other popular tobaccos. Came in, saw me working, and knew me from the pipe shows I had attended, and said, "Marty, I've got a store in San Francisco that I can't own because it's a conflict of interest with my being a sales rep for this company and being a silent partner in this store. But my other partner crapped out, and I need a buyer. Would you be interested? No." I'm not interested. I know the store. It's a lousy location. I can't, can't, can't consider buying it. Well, come up and take a look. So I, and I and my daughter, who was about 10 or 12 at the time, I don't even think 12, when she didn't have a day of school, we took the train, the commute train up to San Francisco. I live about 35 miles south of San Francisco. And we sat in front of that store for a couple of hours, and I saw how badly managed it was. And the location wasn't quite as bad as I had remembered, which is to say it wasn't on the second floor of this mall, but on the ground floor. If you ever go into real retail, don't be anywhere other than on the ground floor, not two steps down, not two steps up. Make sure there's foot traffic. Anyhow, I thought, well, I don't know if I can make a living out of it, but I can certainly do better than the people in there now. And that DDR is how I came to buy the Sherlock's Haven in San Francisco, which I entered into in August. That was my first, August 1st, 1989. That was my first day in in, uh, full-fledged retail when I had to start making a living, a livelihood, out of my hot, what had been my hobby. And don't think I didn't have knots in the pit of my stomach after a bad day going home and saying, oh my God, we did $75 all day. How am I going to tell Joy that we're going <laughs> to, that we're going to be starving for the next week? But things worked out, obviously. <clears throat> I, I have a question, Marty. You've, you've, I don't know how many pipes you've seen. Up to this point, probably millions, but I'm wondering a couple questions sort of related. Do you have a favorite pipe or uh, is there a favorite pipe you have yet to find or is there one that got away that's memorable? The ones that got away, I really like Dunhill Prince's shells. I, I like the sandblast better than the smooth. And my friend had a couple of beautiful panel Prince shells that were old. They probably were patent numbers. But he wanted 300 for the both of them. And at the time, that was just a lot of money for me. And they're the ones I still think about of, of what I, you know, what got away, the ones that got away. Louis, you had a question? I uh, know. I'm saying hello to a uh, good buddy, uh, oh, Robert okay. Boeing. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but what I, the pipes I like best, that's a good, you know, I think pipes are like people. 
in that each one is so individual. You really make a huge mistake if you say, oh, this person is from Azerbaijan or, or this person is from Mongolia and I don't like Azerbaijanis or I don't like Mongolians or I don't like uh, Peruvians. No, you've got to judge each person one at a time. It's the only, and that and pipes are just like that. You can come up with a brand you think you don't like and grab grab a smoke from one of them and they just hit it off. That happened with me with a pipe. A guy brought it into the store and said, Marty, uh, we'll just make up a name. Joe was interested in this pipe and he's going to come around and take a look at it and, you, and uh, buy it from me. Do you mind holding it for me? What till he comes in? I said, no, Pat, no problem. And I put it on the shelf behind me. And it was a sort of a free hand with a plateau top. And I'm a real traditionalist. I basically that I'm smoking a bent today is an is an anomaly. I normally smoke billiards, prints. I like straight pipes. But I was busy. I was in the store. I was waiting on customers and I wanted to light up a pipe. So I reached behind me, grabbed this pipe filled it up, started lighting it. And I said, oh my God, Joe's never going to see this pipe. It just smoked so well because although it's something on a table in a pipe show, I would never have looked twice at and probably wouldn't have even registered if I looked at it once. Uh, it smoked so good. It's in my cabinet still. Does that help a little bit or hurt a little bit, Tim? That's a great story. No, I, I, I think it speaks to all the mystery in this whole pipe thing. You never know what you're going to come across and it's going to, it's going to change your day. Like the whole thing with the story with the uh, tobacco, you, you know, the, the, you picked up the Latakia. I mean, you know, it's almost like a little bit of chance effect to that because, you know, like you said, what if you didn't pick that up? That sounds like that turned things around for you in a major way. <laughs> totally. Come, look at what I do for a living. Look at what has been the major part of my life for 45 years now. Uh, yeah, and it was all dumb luck. Most of anything we get in life is luck, I think. Luck is such a huge factor. And yeah, pipes are metaphysical. There's, <laughs> you can't look into the wood. You just, <laughs> they're going to do what they're going to do. They're, it's a living thing. Hey, Marty, I have a question for you. Sure, Lou. Uh, so when did you relocate to the West Coast and then what, when in the timeline did you open the shop, Sherlock's Haven? And if you could tell us a little a bit about the shop, because I know you've had some storied uh, customers and uh, uh, entertainers and famous folks dropping in on you. Well, I, uh, in 58, my father took me out to Disneyland and I saw Southern California and that was not for me. Uh, and then I did a stint in Peace Corps training there, too. So I would not have come out to California. I was a New Yorker, uh, died in the wool. But uh, the Army seemed to want my skills and talents. And in 1966, they impressed me into service over my uh, faintly voiced objections. And uh, I was in a small fort in Baltimore, Maryland, when I got orders for Fort Ord, which is right next to Monterey and Carmel in California and the Sergeant Major running the fort, I was running his operation in this small little place, said, uh, you know, I can keep you here with a phone call to the Pentagon because he was a Sergeant Major in Baltimore. He probably knew everybody in the Pentagon. But uh, if I were single and young like you, this is the garden spot of the United States. It's beautiful. I would take, I would take those orders and go out there. So I said, well, Sergeant Major Kowalski, I'll take the benefit of your wisdom. And I went to went to Fort Ord in Monterey, right outside of Monterey. And then my sister's old roommate lived in San Francisco at the time, a, new, a Manhattan roommate, but she had moved back to California. And so I would come up every weekend. This was the summer of love and all that stuff. And uh, I got entranced with San Francisco, which was a beautiful city. So after the Army, I just went back, took my old job, back to save up enough money and I came out to California. And that's how, Lou. And the store, as I explained, was started in 80, by me in 89. It, it existed, but in very, very dire straits up until then. 
Did I did I kind of answer your question? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Sure. So, um, Marty, I have a I, I well, here's here's let's do this. I, I know that you had come with um, a lot more prepared to lay out for us. Why don't I give you a shot at at uh, uh, continuing with that, and then we'll come back and we'll ask some more questions. And again, I want to remind the guys over there on Facebook and YouTube that I'm here to ask your questions of Marty as well. And you can go ahead and put them in when they occur to you, and I'll scroll back and find them um, at any time. So we might I've got a lot like more a questions. Three episode, uh, you know, with Marty because I don't think that's we're right. Right, <laughs> we're going to have to have part two uh, of this one. Absolutely. Definitely. All right. Oh, yeah, I'm just focusing on a few Danish stories here. I'm keeping it uh, restricted to the borders of that small country. Well, the next one is, do you all know of uh, Yes Konovitz? Does that name ring yeah. a bell with you? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great pipe maker. Wonderful. Just a sweet man. Whenever I would go into Denmark, I'd let him know, and he would, with his wife, Bonnie, would meet me in the city, and we'd stroll the streets and... Well, I met Yes at a pipe show in L.A. He and Lars Everson came out to that show at the uh, invitation, I'm pretty sure, of Rick Newcomb, who might be a good guest for you to have, DDR and Tim. He's got, he must have a lot of stories, too. So at that show, Yes had some pipes for sale that he brought. So did Lars. And there was a beautiful sandblast billiard and i've told you that i have that preference for those old classic english shapes but it was going to be 600 retail at this point let's say 1990 just to pick a ballpark date that probably is close i thought well, is somebody bugging me yeah let me let me decline that sorry the interruption uh, I thought, how am I going to sell a sandblast in the store for $600? But if I don't get this wonderful pipe, some other SOB will. <laughs> then they'll have a better pipe than me. And that, Jurgen, goes back to one of your questions. I don't like people getting better pipes to sell than I can get. <laughs> so I bought it, and that's how the relationship between Yes and I started. And so I was the very first U.S retailer to have a con of it. And by the way, I got back to the store and the thing sold in probably a week or less. Well, shortly thereafter, and I, and I don't pick up exclusives because I think that's a little bit confining for the pipe maker. I've always felt that they should have as broad a, a table or, or playing field to sell their wares as possible because these guys work so hard so long with such a skill for really relatively small money per hour. Well, I was picking up the Conovitz pipes to sell and so was Uptown, which at the time was a very big, strong retailer out of Nashville. And I don't mind saying predatory at that. And they wanted to control the market. Well, this goes to the a Chicago show where I had a table, of course, so did Uptown. And yes, Konovitz came. And he had, oh, close to 20 pipes for, for Uptown to sell. Must have brought it to their table. After which, he came over to my table and said, Marty, I've got seven made for you, which was fine because I couldn't afford to buy 20 of his pipes I, I probably didn't think I would have customers for that many, although in retrospect, it wouldn't have been that hard. <clears throat> and laid them out. And of those seven, I like five. I say, I'll buy these five, yes. And while I was making my choice, one of my customers was over looking over my shoulder, Joe Langford, you may know him as the blender for the Seattle Pipe Club blends. He bought a lot of his bulk tobaccos from me originally until I guess he had his own venue to get them. And he said, I like that one, which was one of the two I didn't like. So I actually wound up buying six from Conovitz. But then Yes said, Uptown Marty has asked me to ask you not to display these pipes at this show. Holy cow. 
I think my blood pressure went into four digits. Mm. I just went nuts internally. But for one of two times in my life, I did the right thing. I said, thank you, yes, I'll take care of this. And then I sat down and I counted to 10. After which I got up and I walked over to the uptown table. Keith Peters was their manager of the high grade pipes. And again, I, you know, for some reason I held it together. I'm a pretty emotional guy sometimes. Isaac might, he, he might not confirm that. He, he knows that I'm calm as a cucumber at all times. Anyhow, I said, Keith, let me see if I got this right. Did you ask yes to ask me not to display my pipes at my table during the show? And he said, uh, yeah, Marty, uh, we, we would like our customers to think that we have the exclusive on Yakonovitz pipes. Really? Yes, yes. And, and also, we spend a lot of money on ads. And, we, you know, it's really important for us to be able to sell these as exclusives. I said, Keith, discounting the issue of whose money is greener, do you realize you're stepping over the line of trying to tell me how to run my business? Well, yeah, Marty, but, you know, we really want to be... I said, Keith, you're not listening. You're stepping over the line of trying to tell me how to run my business. This went on about three times. It's clear the man just didn't understand anything or didn't want to. He's a bright guy, so I can't believe he didn't understand. But I, I finally, and Rick Newcomb, as I say, was watching all of this. So if you ever get him, you can ask him what he remembers of the story because, you know, Memories are sometimes faulty, even mine, believe it or not, Dimitri. And uh, <laughs> I just walked away in stunningly. But I did get them to pull that ad where they said they were the exclusive for Conovitz. So that's the Conovitz story. And of course, yes, and I stayed. Uh, in touch and friendly, and he kept selling me pipes for as long as he could until his wife Bonnie died, at which point he was just made uh, oars to combat. I mean, he just couldn't function for a bunch of years. Sweet, sweet man. So that I, I have one more story, actually more than one more, but could, do you have time for another? Is this all right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, please. Because this is one of my, this is one of my all time favorites. I, I hope you like this one. I pull into Copenhagen, and of course, I visit with my very close friend, Bjorn, who would stay at our house when he was visiting Northern California and selling to retail shops here. Just, I, I miss the guy. I miss the guy all the time. He's just such a wonderful man. And I, uh, having dinner at his, at his house with his wife, who's just as wonderful a person, Yvonne, and he said, the Royal Bank of Copenhagen called me and they have prep and home pipes. Uh, they want to sell them. Would you be interested? Would I be interested in prep and home pipes that the bank has? Yeah, I think I'd be interested. Well, let me call him back. So when we met the next day, probably for breakfast or right after, he said, I called the bank and uh, we've got an appointment this afternoon. Well, I'm, I'm just beside myself with imaginings and fantasies, thinking that what pipes must Preben Home have reserved for himself and then offered to the bank for a collateral for a loan? I mean, these must be more than the creme de la creme, because if you've seen some of the straight grains that he's put out, what, $1,200, 24, who knows what the numbers were back then. This must be beyond imagining in a bank. So we go over to the bank and some young man comes out after Bjorn 
introduces himself to whoever is greeting at the door, Royal Bank of Copenhagen. This young man in a business suit takes us through the maze of hallways into a beautifully wood paneled room befitting a royal bank. And he says, wait here a second, I'll go get the pipes. And he comes in with, I think about three or four of those banker boxes with the lids on them and you can grab them by the sides and puts them on the table. And I'm beside myself. I, I don't know. I'm going to pee in my pants or something. <laughs> and I open up the, take off the top lid, and the, each one is in its own box. And I take off the box, and what did I see? I got to speak to one of the old timers here. Louis, what, what did they used to have on the counter of pipe shops? Carl Eric's or Ed, Eric Nording's unfinished, unstained, Free hands at about twenty dollars. Does that ring a bell? Does anybody remember those pipes? Mm. Anybody here? Well, that's what would happen. The the free hand makers would undoubtedly come up with a bunch of pipes in which the grain didn't come up to the standards, and they didn't bother finishing them because it would be cheaper to just sell them as is and let some customers smoke them and dar darken them. Didn't mean they wouldn't smoke well, right? We've already discussed that Briar is going to do what it's going to do. These looked like, the first one looked like that. I said, oh, maybe this is an aberration. <laughs> I opened the second box, same thing, third and fourth and fifth. I finally went into the second banker's box, same thing. They're all stamped prep and home, by the way. And I looked at the young man and I said, you don't have prep and home pipes here. What you have are the pipes his apprentices were making that didn't rise to the standard of anything they could possibly sell to retailers and make money from. You've got, if you're lucky, you've got seconds. And he didn't, of course, believe me because his bosses, his more experienced older bosses, had probably loaned, what, $10,000 on this as collateral. Why? Because Prebin, who you, as you, if you know his reputation, was a very fast liver. Alcohol, perhaps drugs, certainly motorcycles. By the way, he died at 42. That's not an accident, or it is an accident. Must have come in with his invoices, his the ads for his pipes, the price lists from companies like Lane, which showed Preb and Home, uh, 300 series, retail, $1,200. Well, with that kind of collateral and these bankers who knew nothing about pipes must have lent him all that money. And I could just see Previn's face walking Whoa. out of that bank, getting rid of pipes he was going to dispose of. Whether oh he was going to light his fireplace with him in the winter, or give him to beggars on the street, or just make shelf room. Here he got oh. all that money. And not money. only that, and I'm sure he never planned on paying money back to get these pipes back. What would be the point of that? He dropped dead. And these bankers now have this collateral that they don't know what to do with. And after, say, 10 years, because it was approximately 10 years after he had died, they must have looked in the phone book, found Bjarne Nielsen. And by the way, I found they also had called Larson, but Larson wasn't interested. And Bjarne then passed the message on to me. So <laughs> for the one time in your life, You've heard about bankers being beaten at their own game. I think it's one of the most marvelous pipe stories I've ever heard. And by the yeah, way, that's that, the funniest thing, isn't that? And funny, it's and funny, then, Marty. Funny. And the banker, by the way, you could tell from his body language and his facial expressions. He, when he asked me how much I'd be willing to pay for him. I thought, well, I've come this way. I don't like to disappoint people. I really like to make people happy. I can't remember if I said 25 or 35 a piece because they were prepping home pipes and I could get something for them. And he just looked at me like, I am a thief. I'm trying to rob them. 
And he kept waiting for me to up my offer. He thought I was playing a negotiating game. Oh, yeah, when, when I say no, he's going to go, oh, 35, oh, 45, oh, 50. But no, I was glad not to have to carry them back to the U.S. and then deal with U.S. customs, too. So I just kept walking out, and this guy kept waiting for me to up the offer. About a week later, when they figured out what they had, they called Bjarna, come, told him, come get these pipes. They took whatever the heck he offered. And uh, the next time I saw him in the U.S., he said, yeah, he, he bought them and he just sold them to the retailers and probably, you know, doubled his, doubled his money and everybody was happy, except the bankers, of course, who had really been taken. So that's, I, I love that story. That's a great story. <laughs> it, is, it is a great story. Marvelous, marvelous. Thank you. I'm glad you like. I love that story when I think about it. Can I tell you a little quickie? This is sort of a story, not a story, but we're in Denmark. So David Field and I are there looking at um, bringing in and import, importing and distributing the Jorgen Larsen pipes. If you'll remember, he started off being a pipe maker. And by the way, it was a Jorgen Larsen, which was the, in fact the pipe that I talked about being on the shelf that I ordinarily wouldn't have smoked that was marvelous. So I was thrilled at the opportunity to possibly import and distribute his pipes. Of course, that one just is still as a kid. It's a magic pipe, as Fred Hanna said. Get Fred Hanna's book. He's got a story, The Magic Pipe. Smokes good with anything in it. Well, we visiting Jorgen in, in his home right next to uh, Colding. Kurt Ballaby lives there too. Little town of about 35,000 in Denmark. And he's t we're talking about importing, and I think he likes us, and he did go with us as importers. And he said, uh, yeah, but in, in the context of a conversation, but we don't have the pipe culture here in Denmark that you do in the U.S. I go, what? Per capita, the Danes smoke more pipes than anywhere else in the world. What do you mean you don't have it? Oh, yes, we do. But the reason we do that is because pipes are the least expensive tobacco delivery device. Not because they make such wonderful, beautiful pipes. And now you know why, going back a little bit, those gorgeous pipe makers are least appreciated in their own country because they may buy a Stanwell or a, or a basic Bjarn or a Jarl or something like that, but they won't buy a Sven Bang or a Tom L. Tang or a Lars Everson. They will tend not to spend that money. And, and that's, that's the talk. There's a little museum outside of this town of Colding called Traphold. It's a craft museum. It's beautiful. Every time I visited that town, I go to that museum and they display Danish furniture, Danish silver work, Danish painting, Danish... Um, ceramics, all marvelous, all marvelous stuff. And I wrote a letter to the director when I got home and I said, if you're ever looking for another product for an ex exhibition, if you fall backwards out of your chair, your head would fall into the yards of some of pipe makers who are the most highly regarded craftsmen in the world. Some of these guys are getting thousands of dollars for their pipes. You might consider that, although I know a prophet is simply never recognized in his own land. And I did get a letter back from that director saying thank you, but I'm sure it was thrown into the circular file uh, after that. So, so that's it. I, I was. Uh, that's it for the. I mean, there's plenty more, but you guys have been so nice. DDR said you're the nicest guys he's ever had to deal with. And of course I told him, nah, but you are, you really, thank you so much for listening. I wanted to I close, just, yeah. I wanted to close with a couple of memory quotes because stories are memories. Is, is that all right? Or uh, do you want to? Please yes, do. please. <laughs> Here's one from Algis Huxley. Every man's memory is his private literature. I'm sure you all feel that way about your memories. It's your, it's a story of your life. Then Julian Barnes said, <laughs> who knows, what you end up remembering isn't always the same as what you have witnessed. <laughs> uh, I'm going to skip because you guys have been listening so long. Here's, a, here's the last one by Kazuo Ishiguro from his book, A Pale View of Hills. Memory, I realize, 
can be an unreliable thing. Often it is heavily colored by the circumstances in which one remembers, and no doubt this applied, applies to certain of the recollections I have gathered here. And uh, and that's it. Thank you guys so much for listening. Yeah. I love telling these stories. I just want to give a quick comment uh, uh, to Marty. Marty, I just want to let you know that you, you can command the room. And basically, I can listen to you for hours. And uh, for you apologizing about, you know, you're talking to, no, it's not. As you probably notice, everybody's quiet because all of us are listening to you. And I thank you uh, very much for joining uh, the Virtual Pipe of Canada. Sir, I can listen to you for hours. No doubt well, about it. Uh, you, you know what? It almost makes it worth it for the damn espresso. Look, double espresso. <laughs> Tim, Tim, if I give you a couple of bucks, can we parlay that espresso into a beer? I think we can work on it. We can okay. make it happen. That's good enough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Marty, Marty I think, I, I, uh, you'll be interested in uh, one little story. Uh, when John Wayne was a guest uh, star on um, uh, Beverly Hillbillies in one episode, as a payment, he took half bottle of bourbon. Not even full <laughs> bottle, but half Thank bottle you. of That's bourbon. Good. I'd be I'd be lucky to get that, huh? <laughs> Marty, do you have to take off, or can you no, stick around no, a little bit? No, no, I'm I'm yours. Awesome, because we we have I'm sure a bunch of other uh, questions. By the way, I did want to uh, exchange one quote for another on the theme that you were that you were sharing about memory. Oscar Wilde said, when I'm traveling on a train, I always like to have a good book along, so I always make sure I take my own diary. Yeah, but he asked a while, yeah. Um, I do have one question uh, to get it started off with. This is from the uh, some of the guys over there on on uh, Facebook. And um, this is on the, the um, subject of your familiarity with different pipes and pipe brands and pipe makers. Uh, he says, I'm primarily a Sheraton buyer since my first week in pipes going back decades. Can you share anything about Sheraton's? Maybe a little bit. I know that when I went to Europe after college in 65, I knew uh, two brand names and somebody told me a third one. Uh, Dunhill and Sheraton, and I went to their shops, and those pipes back then for a basic Sheraton or Dunhill was $18.50. $18 well, that would have been more than three days of travel using Froma's book Europe on $5 a day. So I couldn't afford that, but I did get myself a Barlin, which I still have, which was uh, trans exchanging the currency was about $5.60. Notice how I parse it down to even dimes back then. But Sheraton, I think, was more handmade than any pipe at the time, more than Dunhill. I think every pipe was bench made. So you really have, if you have the old Sheratons, a, a beautifully carved pipe, and they were able to pick out their woods and come up with the best grains. If you'll recall, when they folded, I think there were, might have been at least two and maybe three companies using the old Sheraton wood that came out very strong. There was Upshaw, there was Wilmer, and in my mind there's one more, but I, I'm not sure that's the case. But they had so much good wood that when those pipes came out, they came out with almost nothing but great straight grains and really took the market. So Sharon's a great pipe. And if you like it, stay with it. Marty, let me ask a question. You had so great stories about Danish pipe makers. Do you have any stories about uh, Sixten Ivarsen or his granddaughter, uh, Nana Ivarsen? Uh, no, not really. We actually went up to Sixten's studio during one of our trips to Copenhagen. I think it was right off of the Stroyet, the walking street, but he wasn't in that day. I wish, I wish I could fill you in. And Nana would come to always to the um, Chicago show. And she's a beautiful young lady. And of course we've conversed, but I'm sorry, I don't have any stories for either of those two. Lars, Lars, I can tell you a little bit. Uh, I was too stupid when I bought that first Konovitz in L.A. to know what I was looking at when I looked at Lars, so I didn't establish a relationship. But almost the very last day of my store in San Francisco, Lars and his wife were in town. 
So he came over and some photographer took a picture of all my regular customers in front of the store. And then they signed the big card. And I have the picture on the wall. And in that picture is Lars too. So I have a memory of Lars with us, but I never really, and, and of course we always spoke at the Chicago show, but I, I didn't have much interaction business-wise with him, I'm sorry to say. Problem. Well, guys, go ahead and just uh, pitch your questions directly to Marty. And um, again, over there on Facebook and YouTube, if you got questions, put them in the chat. I'll ask them for you. Um, and then if we still have time, I do have a, some questions I want to ask you about West Coast Pipe Show. So, um, but I'm going to yeah. turn it back over to the group here. Hey, Marty, I just, this is Can a... Can I ask a question afterwards? Yes, of course. Okay, go ahead, David. Andrew, go ahead. Okay, all right, thanks. Hey, Marty, I wanted to uh, say hello. My uh, good friend of mine, who, who we work in the same company uh, as Robert... Uh, uh, Lombardi, I think you know Robert pretty I well. I certainly do. And, and uh, I also wanted to say I um, was lucky enough when I uh, got into pipe smoking not very long ago, I, I got over to the Ed Edwards uh, Pipe Shop in uh, very close to where we work and uh, met Debbie and Rick. And I never got to go to the uh, one of the meetings there, but I was sad to hear that shop uh, was closed up. But uh, great, great people, and I really enjoyed being in there. Well, that's great, Andrew. And, and we'll get to meet. I'm working with Robert now. Yep. And, uh, he's he's actually putting in a lot of time and effort to help me photograph my pipes better, and uh, yeah, yeah, we're 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 become pretty good friends. Thank you. Now, I'm I'm sure we'll get to meet. Buddy, go ahead. Well, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, what's your opinion about the prices of downhill? And uh, other, uh, the high prices, does it, uh, does it um, justify uh, the nature of the pipe and the quality of the pipe? Does it uh, justify the high prices, which are uh, sometimes uh, beyond belief? Are there any lawyers here who are going to sue me for uh, slander? <laughs> All right. Uh, my opinion is pretty much what it sounds like yours is too, Fabi. Uh, Dunhill sold. I, I have a really good story in the future uh, with Dunhill and the manager of the pipes branch of Dunhill, but they sold to a French luxury brand, Richmond, something like that. And they yeah. and that brand represents some very, very expensive watches, stuff like that. So they're not really a pipe maker any longer. They're a brand. And I'm not sure that they even have a, um, anybody in the, in the factory who could make a pipe from a block of briar. So do I think it's justified? No. I think if you're going to take that kind of money, there are some marvelous craftsmen out there who can make you uh, a wonderful pipe for that kind of money. But, but remember... It's still a very famous brand. And when some woman who gets all the money from her husband anyhow takes his money to buy him a present, she can feel confident walking into Dunhill, getting insulted by some clerk at $8.50 an hour to, to buy him a pipe that she thinks he'll like. But, geez, don't, don't, uh, you're not going to get much if you sue me, guys. It's, it's, it's not worth it. That, is that pretty much what you think, Fadi? I'm, I'm, I'm um, with you. I think that uh, there are pipes uh, which are not expensive and uh, which smoke perfectly and wonderfully. And uh, I don't see any difference uh, when I... I have two downhills, but uh, honestly, I didn't see any... Uh, better quality of my other uh, pipes. Uh, so as you say, there are uh, several pipe makers here in the world now, uh, especially in Europe and in the States, uh, who uh, make uh, pipes as beautiful and as as good as uh, Dunhill pipes. Oh, so I don't oh, see what's, uh, what's or even better. Yes. Yeah. 
So I don't see why it's, they are that expensive. I'll tell and you I'm, another story. I'm okay with it. Yes, it's a it's question of prestige, I think, only. Dennis, give me a second. I saw you had your hand up. Let me let me just finish with Fadi, okay? And then we'll get to you. I okay. So, um, two things. One, if you want a Dunhill, get an old Dunhill. Use Dunhills in very good condition. If you keep your eyes open, can be 150, 200 bucks. You got a great pipe. It's broken, and if it's clean properly, it'll smoke even better than it would have new. And you can save Boku bucks. Number two. And here's another good story. And Bjorn told me that we were at a show. Bjorn came to me. And I knew, as I, as you've heard, I was close to Bjorn. He didn't make up. I never heard him say anything that wasn't very accurate. The Dunhill people came up to him and said, Bjorn, can you sell us some blocks? And Bjorn said, no, you know, all the good blocks I use for myself. How am I going to sell you blocks? I've got some seconds or thirds that I wouldn't use, but you don't want that. And they said, oh yeah, we can, we can use those. We can do something with them. So that's what Dunhill was at least doing then. Now that's true. This goes back probably 15, 20 years, but they, as I say, were not making their own pipes even then. Dennis, go ahead. Julie, I just had my thumb up agreeing with you guys. Oh, oh. Not necessarily making a hand up with a comment, oh. but since you mentioned dung hills, uh, uh, my my only dung hill that I ever had was one I picked up at a uh, department store that had probably been sitting there since the 40s uh, because they still had the $19 price on it in the 80s. So I bought it, smoked it and traded it because I was that impressed with it. I got you. I actually think the old Dunhill smoke wonderfully. But again, that's personal and and uh, yeah, so be it. Yeah, I, I can add to Dunhill's story. I just smoked this one. I bought it a long time ago on eBay in original box in a, with the original uh, mail order sales receipt. Uh, pipe stamped uh, 1981, uh, but uh, it was actually sold in November of uh, 1980, and original price $50, uh, $55 plus $1.50 uh, shipping. <laughs> uh, I, I paid for this uh, pipe $50, so basically I bought it for the price of uh, slightly cheaper than the new pipe. Nice. It smokes very well, but my $30 Unfinished Sivinelli smokes better. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I don't Buddy, doubt. Buddy, this is Arti Haran from India. I just wanted to ask you one thing. Since in your long years in uh, selling pipes, you must have come across thousands of pipes must have uh, crossed through your hands. Has there been any one specific pipe or few of them which you thought are too good to be sold to somebody which you retain for yourself even to this day uh, do I you just, think of yeah, any well, one such pipe sure, well, any I can, few of them as I say everything's a story so one quick uh, answer is uh, somebody just traded a pipe to me it was a Euro that he, I don't know what he didn't like about it and it's really not a beautifully made pipe but again, I just picked it up and I smoked it and I said, okay, he traded it. I'll give him the value we agreed on, but um, I'm keeping it. But here's here's a good story. I was about to wrap up and, se and send a pipe of no particular merit in terms of pedigree. It was only $50 unsmoked, but it was a really nice shaped billiard. Again, a shape I like, good size stem for me, everything. So I wrote the customer, this was a website sale, and I said, Jim, I don't remember his name. Jim will do. I said, Jim, you paid for the pipe. I'm ready to send it. If you want it, you can have it. But I really like this pipe. Could we trade? Could, could I do something for you? I'll give you double the value. So he said, well, you know, nah, you got a little ashed in there. Well, I did. I had a little ashed in that I wasn't smoking much. So the guy, which would have been more than double what this pipe sold for. This pipe 
that I was interested in was a no name, and I, or maybe a store name. It was, a, as they say, of no pedigree whatsoever. So this guy got an Ashton from me. I kept, I paid twice for a pipe I already, ha- I already owned, and I smoked it, and it was not very good. So that's gone. But yeah, that that <laughs> Rachmanidron. That's I, it, it's just a funny business. Marty, before I'm sorry, we I mispronounced your name, Rachmanidron. Tell me again. Ramachandran. Ramachandran. That's Ramachandran from India. Ram, I, I got that part. The Ma- India I can pronounce. Marty, before we run out of time. Um, I wanted to ask you about the West Coast Pipe Show. Um, and uh, I, I know that there are probably some guys here who would also have some questions for you. But uh, the, on your website, it says, basically, don't get excited because we're waiting to see if um, Nevada lifts all of its um, uh, COVID-19 restrictions. restrictions. Are we right. still in that waiting mode? Yes, we are. Uh, in fact, uh, on, on the picture, you're right next to my good friend, Bill Battaglia, who was an invaluable, invaluable assistant at that show. And if we have the show, we're going to work him to the bone because everybody wants to go to the, to the show, having been kept away from them for so long. Here's the issue, and you got it exactly right, EDR. Steve O'Neill is really running the show now. And his his position is what you said. If all restrictions are lifted, that is to say no social distancing, no masks, et cetera, we can have this show. There is a caveat to that, and this is strictly Steve's, but it's not a bad one. He's concerned, one, we probably still won't be able to get the European and Asian guests at the show because of flight and incoming restrictions. And B, he's not thrilled about people having to fly cross country wearing masks. So you're right, it's a tenuous situation. Uh, I'd like to think it'll be a go, but it's 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 hard to say that. God, we, we all are so eager to get together and sit down and have a smoke together and a beer and bullshit about our pipes and our tobacco and and be you know little boys again together and it's it's so hard, but that's that's where we are. All right, so I know it's probably nothing that um, you can peg a date to, but uh, is there a yes, is I there can. a go no go date for that? Yes, yes, there is. Could you ask? I'm sorry, I I overlooked that. The, the, the date is September 1st. Reason being, if we cancel by December, say, 2nd or 3rd, but we're going to, you don't want to cut it that close. The 1st, we don't get penalized. If we cancel afterwards, we're going to lose a ton of money and we don't make any money. on. There, there's no profit here. So we have to cancel in time not to be penalized. And also the guests need a good two months advance notice because they're going to have to cut out, carve dates from work or carve, you know, get get plane reservations, make hotel reservations, do the necessities in anticipation of the show. You can't say, oh boy, it's two weeks to go and we're ready to go now. And yes, the show is on. So September 1st, will be the drop dead date. That that's good to know cuz Dimitri was going to go by steamer around the horn to get to the West Coast pipe show. You could yeah, that <laughs> just, that's how we pegged it they, that's they, right. they, they, We got we got a good travel date. Well, how long yeah. has West Coast pipe show been going on? Uh, I think we started 2002 does does that sound right, Bill? Yeah. Oh, Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like we passed 10 years. When you, I think, oh, we've had ten years. When you meet people, coming up. if if you meet somebody at a, you know, a, at a dinner or something like that, and they're maybe not pipe smokers, how do you describe what the show is? So, start, start that question again. Uh, so I'm curious, like you know, 
people ask me all the time, what do you do? What's your business all about? And then I, and, and they're not in my world. They're not in my industry. So I have to find creative ways to tell them about it. When you meet people who are maybe not pipe smokers, how do you describe the show? How do you just tell them what you do? You can't even, dis- you can't even talk about pipes to most people today. They have no idea what you're talking about. So when I say I'm in pipes, I always go, you know, holding my hand like I'm holding a pipe, pipes, because they think I'm talking about plumbing. <laughs> yeah, you can't. It's, or it's, you're right. It's a really hard call. People don't know. Pipes are, we're, we're a wonderful little niche. Oh, and, and let me get back to that. Let me, let me, uh, um, Embellish that a little bit. The state of Nevada has already lifted restrictions. <clears throat> and there's going to be a trade show there at which smoking's allowed on the exhibition floor, etc. We, but they petitioned for that allowance. We don't want to go to the state. We don't want to let the state know we exist. We want to f- stay under the radar, because if people find out we're there, there's a percentage of people that are going to come after us. They don't care that they're taking their little bastards to McDonald's and ramrodding that putrescence down their unsuspecting gullets. They're just out to get smokers. So we are not advertising, and we are waiting for total open so that we don't have to ask anybody. Am I making sense? Absolutely. Well, guys, what other questions do you have for Marty? Yes, sir. Mar- Marty, uh, uh, just a quick question. I know you... Uh, I don't I take questions from you, Alvin. I'm just yes, kidding. I do. Yes, please yeah. do. Yeah. I have my reservations at for the West Coast, but I've got the reservations. Thank you. The Thank Hotel you. Right now. Thank you. I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist. Good but man. But my question is this. If, if, if uh, hypothetically things fall into place where those restrictions are lifted. Uh, the, what uh, do you anticipate, it, this being the first really big show that's happened since the onslaught of the pandemic, you anticipate a pretty good attendance of that? Oh, more than pretty good. We expect a super enthusiastic attendance. And instead of having one rogue uh, entering the auditorium on the first day, we'll have to have two. And that's why I'm talking about Bill working overtime. We're going to have to go and make it a little bit more, uh, a little easier for people to enter the room because we don't want them piling up a uh, long line down the stairs into the casino. Yes, I and I've already spoken with Steve O'Neill about that, and he talked about expanding the number of tables, and I'm saying no. We can perhaps... Uh, stick in as many as 115. After that, we'd have to go to other rooms. But that would require more manpower. So we'll have to limit it, and people will be disappointed who may want tables but are a little late registering if the show is open. But it's best to be small and good, in my opinion, which is why I never expanded my business, why I never opted to take on exclusive contracts with... I would rather it be just me with my hands on all aspects of it that I can control. That's how I'm comfortable. If you're Chicago, that's fine. You have a whole pipe club working with you and they're equipped to do that. They're bigger. (laughs) As uh, Mel Brooks said, if we all learn to play the violin, we could be bigger and better than Montavani. Marty, a quick question. You uh, mentioned Bernie Nielsen. Uh, did you have any dealings with uh, Vigo? Yes, yes. Uh, he, really nice guy. Uh, they're not related, as you know, because there's only five surnames in Denmark anyhow. And, and Nielsen is probably four of the five. But, uh, yeah, I got to meet him early on. Uh, unfortunately, here's a little story that I really can't confirm, but I believe he's a super sweet guy, nice guy, good pipe making family. I forget his father's first name. Do you remember, Kent? Nels, maybe? 
Uh, I don't remember. I don't. It'll come to me. Anyhow, he apparently there had been some drug use in the family, and he apparently took the took the rap maybe for his father or his brother. This is rumor, boy. Don't please don't don't brew eat this about because I'm going to be sued now for everything. And uh, so when he got back into pipe making, he was sort of super humble and quiet. And I did buy pipes from him at very, very good prices. And people started recognizing the pipe prices versus quality value. So I do know the man. Yeah, yeah, good man. So here's uh, one of his pipes. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. One of my favorites. There you go. Yeah. Notice how pipes are personalized and you have a connection with the pipe maker. Uh, I don't think that's the case with the wristwatch on your hand or the diamond or the marriage band that you have. What what other property do you own that is so personal that when you can't find it, you start sweating a little bit and you get a little bit panicked and nervous and you're trying to justify your, you know, it's just a pipe. I'm not that worried. It's only a pipe. And then you just rip open every single drawer, lift up every single couch pillow, every single pocket that you know you haven't worn since last winter to find that thing. Yeah, I have over I, I, I pipes. once uh, yes. left a bag of pipes at a shop. And when I reached home, I found out that my pipes were not with me. I was driving my 600cc small car at 180 kilometers per hour on the highway, high beaming a police officer car just to get to that shop. (laughs) How much time did you have to do in jail? (laughs) Luckily, none. (laughs) Good, good. And, and And they had your pipes, right? Yeah, they had my pipes. You know, some guy, some guy brought a whole bunch of pipes into my shop. Isaac knows him, Tom. I think Isaac knows this story. He brought a bunch of pipes into my shop for repair. And they came back, and I must not have either made the proper notes in my book, or he didn't come back for a long time to claim them. He walked into the store, asked for his pipes. And one of the customers said, oh, is it these? And they were in my ten dollar basket. Right, the, they were on the, uh, on the on the wall on, on the, the counter board. on the counter. Ten dollar. We're still friends, fortunately. Oh yeah. <laughs> he he recovered his pipes, but I had I had thrown them. So you're lucky, Amir, that yours uh yours didn't get sold. Yeah. Well, I have over hundred pipes, and I remember where and how I got every single one of them. All right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. They're personal. Before we go uh, into the last few minutes of the meeting today, <clears throat> not yet, by the way, because we still have some time. So don't don't go running out the door. But we are approaching that time. And, and Marty, just f- for your own um, uh, interest, I usually kick people out after a couple hours because I know that a lot of the guys are going to have to go and justify this two hours to their families and their wives. And I don't want to get anybody in trouble so that we can all come back next week. Um, But I did want to say a couple things. First of all, if you're watching on the live stream, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, just thank you very much for being here. And all you guys in the Zoom room, you know how I feel about you. You're amazing. And I appreciate that you're here to meet some of these great guests like Marty. Um, we've got more coming up. We're working on a, a couple of really um, different kinds of guest speakers and in, in meetings. Uh, and I don't want to let the cat out of the bag yet because we're still working on some of the details. Uh, but we will be putting notices up on the Facebook page so that you all know about it. If, if you're a Facebook user, if you're a Facebooker, um, then uh, there's no reason not to go over to the um, uh, Virtual Pipe Club group page and just sign up. It's not like you're really signing up for anything. It's just, uh, I want to be on the inside where all the cool people hang out. And that's for that. And if you're over there on YouTube and watching the YouTube and you have not yet hit the subscribe button, I'm, I'm going to come to your house and personally shame you. That is That is what I'm planning on doing. So... Hit that subscribe button. Um, 
and for those of you who uh, may be watching this for the first time or watching this in the future, we do this every week. Uh, every Saturday morning, 11 a.m. West Coast time, 6 p.m. London time until we change the clocks. Uh, so come and join us uh, at that. So, guys, this is our, our last chance to ask Marty any questions about uh, West Coast Pipe Show, about Sherlock's Haven. I have a question about Sherlock's Haven, um, although I had thought that maybe you were in that shop earlier than the 80s. But um, I, I wanted to know if there was ever any, like, crossover between Sherlock's Haven and City Lights, you know, pipes and beatniks. Okay. Uh, no. Yeah, one of my, one of my customers, Jack something, he was one of the poet laureates of San Francisco. But no, I never, I never met, um, God, see, my mind is going. Ferling, Ferlinghetti. Ferlinghetti, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And I, no, I don't think there was any any crossover. But Sherlock's, I do want to I do want to put in a nice word for Sherlock's, even though it's gone. Frankly, guys, it was the Camelot of pipe shops. I had such good customers. It was such a wonderful experience every single day. As you know, we solved all of the world's problems every day, and of course, the world kept turning, so we solved them all again the very next lunch time when the customers all came in. And that boys and girls is what we call in the radio business dead air. So I'm going to start kicking people out. First of all, Marty, you are amazing. <laughs> of one of, uh, of Several people over there on the live stream and in the chat have said that you have now achieved the top level. You, you have now officially become the best guest ever. So thank you for, for being here for that. And I'm, I'm just getting warmed up. I know. That's right. So we're definitely, this is my last question for you. Would you come back and join us again on another show? Can I get another cup of coffee out of you guys? Tim, what do you think? No, the answer is no. <laughs> no, great idea. No. Yeah, I'd be happy to be with this group again if, they're, if they'll have me. Thank you. Yes, Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for being here. That's yeah, thank Grandpa, you, Marty. Grandpa's always like people who listen. This demographic, nobody cares about us anymore. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. I'm sorry if I kept you too long. DDR said he doesn't want to get you in trouble. You know me now. I want to get you all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good way of, of doing it. If we And, and we have uh, stayed over um, occasionally, but Oliver's not here today to be the good dad. I have to, I'm the bad dad to chasing okay. people out. Um, well, as I say every week, thank you guys because you, you're the best part of my week. This, this is like the most fun I have. Uh, my wife tells me every, every week um, that she's glad I have a hobby. So for two hours every week, I don't bother her. Um, but this is, I wouldn't have stuck with this hobby if it hadn't been for you guys. So thank you. And um, in light of what we were talking about going to the West Coast Pipe Show, whatever your method of staying healthy is, washing your hands, wear your mask, get your vaccines if you haven't done so already. Just do, do whatever makes sense to you because I hope that you stay safe and healthy and that you're back here next week. Yeah. Right? And write down your questions for next time if they do have me back so you don't forget them. I love, I love it. I will we'll have you back. We'll All right. back. <laughs> That's all we got for this week. Thank you for being here, and I will see you next Saturday. Thank you, Marty. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Marty. Thank you, so much. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you, Marty. 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 Wonderful meeting. Wonderful meeting. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you all. Terrific.